Well, hello, friends. Thank you for tuning in to this episode of Datadog On. I am your host, Brandon West. And Datadog On, if you haven't tuned in before, is a video series where we speak with the engineers that build and operate Datadog. Today, I'm excited to host the episode Datadog On Site Re Reliability Engineering. And with me, I have two awesome engineers from our site reliability engineering team. We have Laura and Rick. Why don't you go ahead and introduce yourselves? So hi, I'm Laura Devazine. Uh, I'm a staff engineer here at Datadog. I've been at Datadog for a little over a year now. Uh, prior to that, I was at Google. And prior to that, I spent uh, almost 15 years as a software engineer, so not a, a site reliability engineer at all. Um, I, uh, I work on the team that manages Datadog's uh, instant response processes, so making sure that we are prepared to respond to various things that go wrong, which is obviously generally thought of as one of the many SRE functions. Um, yeah, and I'm likely to have cats interrupt at some point during this. <laughs> Thank awesome. you, Laura. Um, hey, everybody. Uh, my name is Rick Manji. I am a staff engineer on the API uh, platform team here at Datadog. Uh, I've been here for about just over two and a half years, I believe. Um, I've been in the industry for just about 30. Um, so obviously not all as an SRE. <laughs> um, actually, most of my career ha has been spent in startups in, in New York. Um, and uh, Datadog is uh, one of the bigger companies that I've worked for. Um, yeah, I uh, the API uh, platform team here is part SRE team and part platform team. Um, so we provide uh, support for all of the API backends, um, and uh, our customers are the uh, the product engineers who are building the products that our Datadog users uh, love and enjoy. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm in I'm in New York. Um, I guess fun fact, uh, I almost became a chef instead of a software engineer. Awesome. Well, uh, sometime when I visit New York, I'm gonna have you cook something for me. I was about to say. See how that, see how that <laughs> would have turned out. But thank you for those introductions. Uh, again, my name is Brandon West. I am a team lead on the developer advocacy side of things. I started working as a web developer in around 1999. So I've seen a lot of this happen, but not from the SRE side. So I'm bringing a little bit more of a, a web developer, app developer perspective to the conversation here. So before we jump in, uh, I wanted to set the context and give you some information on Datadog. So Datadog is a monitoring and analytics platform that helps companies improve observability of their infrastructure and applications. If you're here, hopefully you're already familiar with some of our capabilities, already trying out the product. Thank you very much. Now, Datadog is at a scale where we have tens of thousands of customers that are operating millions of hosts that send us tens of trillions of events every day. So we have some challenges uh, of scale and breadth and distributed systems and complexity and all of that fun stuff. And obviously that has an impact on how we approach site reliability engineering, uh, keeping all of these systems running and making sure that uh, our customers can access their data. So before we jump into defining SRE and all that fun stuff, I just want to note that if you have a question, uh, please use the Q&A function. Uh, we'll go through them at the end. We're hoping to save around 15 minutes to go through all of those questions. We won't be checking the chat for questions, uh, so feel free to comment and share your experiences there with the group. But for those questions, make sure you get them into the Q&A. All right, so let's define a few things. So what is site reliability engineering? Well, it was popularized by Google in 2016 with the release of this book via reliability engineering. Now, I think it's important to remember that this definition uh, is represents one implementation in a, in a specific context. But uh, let, let's I'll just read it real quick. SRE is what you get when you treat operations as if it's a software problem. Our mission is to protect, provide for, and progress the software and systems behind all of Google's public services with an ever watchful eye on their availability, latency, performance, and capacity. I think that's a pretty solid definition. It's widely accepted, uh, and, and like I said, it's popularized. But if you're interested in that definition, you can check out sre.google. You can go get that book and read it. Uh, you're probably more interested in how we think about SRE here at Datadog. So let's get into that. Uh, Laura, how do you define site reliability engineering? 
Yeah, so one of the things that I like to call out about Google's definition is that that's very particular to a company that has a, a huge business in ads and is a very, very large company, right? And so what does it, what does SRE mean and how do you how do you implement it if you're not that size and with sort of the money, the money, the money just coming in? Um, so so I have two sort of versions of the SRE definition that I give to people. One is sort of my elevator pitch version, right? SRE is what happens when your beautiful code meets the real world. And what I mean by that is as developers, we write code that makes a lot of assumptions that the world is well-structured, right? That um, networks are reliable, that I can always reach my other services, um, you know, that users will send me well-formed data, that I won't be running out of resources, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you know, that, that computers won't just fail out from under me. And so SRE is what happens when you stop getting to assume that all of those things are true because the real world is very messy. And so to me, SRE is sort of the process of taking that very beautiful code that works well if the world is neat and clean and making it work in reality. Um, the other thing that I like to call out is that that Google definition is very similar to DevOps, right? That the official Google line is that SRE is an implementation of DevOps. But to me, I think it's really important to distinguish what is different about SRE versus DevOps. And I like to say that DevOps is about operating systems better. It's about taking your existing system and building automation on top of it to make it better to operate, very much in a software engineering mindset. Um, but SRE is about shifting that left. It's about building systems that are better to operate. Instead of writing something that presses the button or auto restarts something every five minutes, let's make it so that you don't have to auto restart your service every five minutes. Why does it need to be restarted, right? And SRE tries to be about that shift left. And that to me is the other thing that really distinguishes SRE from DevOps. Uh, I know Rick, Rick has some other ways of thinking about this. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I love your, your definition of it and I think it's spot on. Um, I, I also like to think about SRE as a natural evolution, right? Um, we've been continuously evolving our practices of how we write and operate software to keep up, not even to get ahead of, but just to keep up with, you know, the business requirements and, and the capabilities that we have in front of us now. Um, and SRE is just the next evolution. You know, we've, we've, we evolved DevOps, you know, in order to keep up with, uh, with the, the new capabilities that we had in front of us with, 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 uh, with, with, with Git, obviously, and with the cloud and with the ability to spin up servers really quickly, um, you know, we had to adapt. And, you know, the way that we did that was we said, let's, let's start instrumenting a lot of these systems with more code, right? Um, so that we can actually just write a line of code, write, you know, some YAML or some JSON and some XML back in the day, right? And, and, and it would cause a change that would get our new system up in an hour or, you know, five minutes or, or a half an hour, something like that. Um, and now, you know, we've, we've pushed the boundaries again, and we've been asked to be able to scale things immediately, right, to be able to auto scale and to be able to spin up entire new data centers in, you know, a matter of hours, right. Um, and whereas that would have taken months in, in the beginning. Um, and in order to do that, we just have to, you know, extend DevOps further and start instrumenting more as code. Um, and along the way, we've been asked to provide much better reliability. Um, and in order to meet those demands, um, you know, we, we have to start thinking about our systems in terms of reliability first class. Um, and I think that's where SRE comes in. Thanks for those definitions. I think that's helpful context and helps us understand how you both see the world a little bit as we begin this conversation. So yeah. Rick, you have spoken before about the evolution mm -hmm. of SRE, how we got from where we were to, to mm -hmm. here. So can you walk us through sort of the, the evolution? Yeah. So, 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 so I think I'm very fortunate in, in that I started in this industry, like just as the web happened, you know, um, which was just good fortune of being born at the right time, I guess. Um, and as a result, I've seen the whole, you know, the whole evolution until today. And I've, you know, been kind of thinking a lot about um, breaking up, you know, we're at 30 years now with with the web, just about, uh, depending on how you count. Um, and if we divide that into, you know, uh, three decades of change and and talk about the major differences we can really see why we've gotten to SRE right so in the in the first decade 
um, you know, I, I, I threw this slide together for another talk um, a little while ago. Um, and we, we really literally started, you know, by putting servers in closets, right? Um, you, you wanted to put up a website, you had to go get a machine and you put it in the closet and you plug the cables in and you installed, you know, uh, and, uh, NC HTTP or, you know, Apache um, at, at, after a few years. Um, and then if you wanted to scale that, you know, it was a matter of, we came up with load balancers and, you know, we were able to split the data between two web servers. Um, you know, talking to your database in a bigger closet. And then we came up with this idea of firewalls and application servers so we could start separating business logic from uh, from the presentation logic. We came up with MVC architectures and stuff like that, right? And then we, we said, oh, now, you know, the businesses started latching on and we started being able to sell things online. And um, that required, you know, queuing systems to send emails and, and to process orders and stuff like that. Um, but it was always driven by the adoption of business, really, um, and, and industry wanting to to use the web. Um, finally, by the end of the first ten years, you know, we've we've got we started talking about data planes and you know CDNs and firewalls and 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 network attached storage and things like this, right? Um, but it was still very very. Uh, manual, right? If you wanted to make a change to something and add a new a new server, it literally took a month, right? You you had to order the the new servers from uh, from Sun Microsystems or or Dell or somewhere like that, and they had to ship it to you, and it came to your office, and you installed the software manually. Um, and then you had to go in and you had to plug it in manually, and you had to set up routing, and you had to set up networks, and all this this stuff stuff took a lot of time. So change was still, it was still very much a shrink wrap software world, um, the way that we delivered software. Um, I think some some folks don't realize that when we say we ship software, that comes from when we actually used to print it to, yeah, to I the mean, media and then package it up and ship it. But I think the yeah. the, the way I take, the, my takeaway from this first decade is that it's basically increasing numbers of complex machines running in increasingly complicated closets. Um, yeah, but let's, exactly. let's, move, let's move on to the, the second and third decade. <laughs> is where I think things start to really accelerate and get in interesting as we take advantage of that yeah. uh, in increased bandwidth. Yeah, so when we get, you know, in the second decade, um, we we get the cloud, right? That was probably the biggest innovation that happened. Um, and along with that, we had to develop not just tools, but also processes to to accommodate the changes that we were being asked to, uh, to create. And I've, I've realized, um, in thinking about this uh, over the last several months, that uh, so much of it was impacted by the requirements uh, that were being asked uh, for us. So the first time that I remember real, you know, immediate feedback coming through in a, in a, with our users was A/B testing um, a lot of uh, uh, e-commerce things, right? So the e the e-commerce industry figured out that we could test out things like putting a button on the left or the right, and what would happen. And then the business was able to say, hey, you know, we need to move this button because too many people are, aren't clicking on it anymore. And we started hearing things like if you can get your shopping cart to load in, you know, under 10 seconds, you, you wouldn't lose customers and that sort of thing. So we started being asked as developers to iterate much more quickly. Um, and that included things, you know, on the software side like Puppet and, and GitHub and Hudson and Jenkins for CI. Um, and AWS to be able to scale up new systems quickly, but we also came up with um, with Agile, right, as a response to moving from sh that shrink wrap world where it was very much what we called waterfall process. You would plan out, you know, delivering things in months to you know every week. I want a new iteration. I want to deploy new things. Um, and then in the third decade, we came up with containers and software defined networks. Um, which allowed us to extend even further and scaffold up entire data centers um, in a matter of minutes. So over these three years, we've these three decades, we've gone from uh, weeks and months to deliver uh, changes in the in the internet to you know seconds or even real time. I mean, if you think about a modern Kubernetes cluster, it's completely dynamic. It's a completely dynamic organism, and it requires a new way of thinking about monitoring and reliability and operations. And that's what SRE is. Thank you for that uh, quick history. Um, 
I certainly have experienced a lot of those changes on the developer side. Uh, they were kind of a, a double-edged sword, right? We love to to move faster and not have to worry about a bunch of the the toil and cruft of day-to-day -day software development. But at the same time, change is hard. And people were telling us we had to focus on improving systems instead of working on the code that we thought the customer was interested in. So definitely a lot of <laughs> conflict in terms of how we thought about just the work that we were doing in collaboration in general. Yeah. Um, Okay, great. No, let's let's get well, Laura. Anything you wanna you wanna add to? Yeah, to the, I think, I think the one other piece that I would add is is sort of what you're alluding to there, Brandon. That it, it very much one of the other process changes that happened was the the notion of you know you build it, you run it kinds of kinds of mm -hmm. companies became a thing. You know, once upon a time it was really the fact that you know you you wrote the code and then it was someone else's job to print it to to physical media and ship it out to customers or you wrote the code and it was someone else's job to get it onto those servers. Mm -hmm. And as we've migrated to faster and faster delivery, it's become your job to get it onto those servers as a developer. Um, yeah. And I think that's also been a big sea change in the industry that is yeah, not we, everywhere, but a lot of places have done that. We spend a lot of time moving in and out of specialized uh, parts of our industry, right? Um, mm -hmm. you know, we used to have a whole slew of, of job descriptions that really just don't exist anymore. And we've invented new ones. I, I used to make sure that the the tape backup jukebox was rotating every day. Yes. That, that's not a thing you do anymore. Yes, I, I have I have recovered from tape backup a database. It is a it used to be a real thing. Yes. All right, great. Yeah. Let's let's move on and get into what people I think really want to talk about, which is how do we implement site reliability engineering at yes. Datadog? So we're going to talk a little bit about some of our challenges at Datadog. Uh, our timeline, how SRE has evolved specifically within our organization, how we structure things, and then some of our best practices that hopefully you'll also be able to implement or consider implementing in your organizations. So we have some unique challenges, uh, as I alluded to at conversation, due to our, to our scale, but there's also a few other things that make SRE a challenge at Datadog. Um, Rick, can you lead us through some of the challenges that Datadog has when it comes to SRE? Yeah, sure. I, I, I think it's important for every uh, every person who wants to practice SRE to really understand what is unique to them, to their organization, um, because it is a, you know, it's a, with any kind of uh, quote unquote process, I think it's important to adapt it to your needs. Um, so our, our, our most important challenges are our, our scale and the fact that we are deployed across multiple cloud providers. Um, those two things, uh, you know, there are companies that are multi-cloud, I'm sure, but most are not, um, and that is is very challenging. And scale, um, you know, I can honestly say that we have just a massive scale, and and you know, there's maybe a couple dozen companies that have the scale that we do. Um, we also are, you know, we know that our business is monitoring other people's infrastructures and other people's environments, um, and we take that very seriously. And that sets, uh, you know, that that sets our bar for reliability because we need to be more reliable than our customers as much as possible, because they count on us. Um, I think every company has this balance. Uh, I think you were just talking about this, Brandon. You know, between balancing feature velocity and reliability, right? Um, as well, I, I would say as costs, um, which are equally important. There's a, you know, people love to say, well, you know, if we just throw more money at the problem, it'll be more reliable. We'll that's just put up more servers. Good. That's super good. Too. But you know, that's fine if you have an unlimited bank account. But I don't know that any of us do. Um, we're we're a company, um, and also about. Balancing uh, tech debt, you know, we all have tech debt. We're going to talk more about that later on, I believe. Um, so I think it's important to you know understand our unique challenges and also understand what are the challenges that are not unique to us. And um, you know, I think the the ones that are not unique to uh, the, the things that are not unique to us, I think, are interesting uh, for us to tell about for everyone else. Yeah, and I, I like to add something that I think is yeah. a little bit in that sort of liminal space of sort of unique to Datadog, sort of common to many companies, which is that in addition to tech debt, we, we are in this really interesting company stage of we were a fairly small company for a long time, and then we hit this major growth stage. And there's a lot of sort of cultural hangover from that too. There's a lot of changes to be made as a company about that. Yeah. 
Definitely. Yeah. And we'll, we'll get into that in a moment. But I want to mention, if you are interested in hearing more specifically about some of these engineering challenges at scale, we do have another episode of Datadog On coming up on March 23rd, Datadog on Data Engineering Pipelines. That's all about mm -hmm. Apache Spark at scale. Uh, the team does some really, really cool stuff with Apache Spark. The, I, I think you'd be impressed by the scale. So definitely tune in if you want to hear uh, how we approach some of those scaling cha challenges from an, the engineering perspective rather than the SRE perspective. Perspective, but Laura, let's let's continue what you were discussing. Uh, like you said, Datadog ha founded in, in 2010. We've been on this journey from startup to sort of hyper growth, uh, becoming a publicly traded company, and all, all of those things. And as you mentioned, that is important context for our unique set of problems and how we approach site reliability engineering. So. Uh, Rick, I know that you've worked at, at startups for a long time, uh, just as I have. Um, but why don't you? Tell us some of these differences here. Um, so, so are we asking me or Laura to? Uh... He said it. Oh, he said Rick. Rick. Okay. Rick uh, <laughs> yeah. Basically, the, the shift from startup to hyper growth. What what changes in terms of? Yeah, I mean, I, I think this is something than I do. <laughs> I, I sure do. Um, yeah, um, I don't want to monopolize all the time. Though. Um, I, I I I think this is a something that is very interesting um, to a lot of companies is, you know, we find ourselves hopefully in this industry going from, you know, you, you start, you join a startup or found a startup so that you hope to hit the hyper growth, right? Um, and it usually doesn't happen, but your mindset is completely different. When you're working at a startup, you don't have the luxury of a project that's going to take more than a quarter at best, right? Um, you know, maybe you take six, eight months to iterate on your first version, but then all of your changes have to be really, really quick. Uh, you can you can pivot once or twice and take, you know, some time, but you're assuming that, you know, if you are still around for this problem to bite you, that you're coding right now, that's going to be a good problem to have, <laughs> right? Because it means that it worked and you got customers or whatever it was that you were looking for, and you have the luxury then to go back and address the tech debt. Um, so it's much more iterative. Ship it right, right, right away. Do it again. Um, you know, you you have the engineers that you have, and you're just trying to de deliver with what you've got. Once you hit the hyper growth stage, you know you've got customers, you have revenue, um, you have the luxury of starting to think about how do I take this thing, this whatever it is, uh, web stack or database or Kafka pipeline, you know, that got me to where I am today and build something to get me for the next 10 years or the next 15 years. Um, and usually those projects, you know, this is when you take on a project that's going to take a year um, because it's worth it um, to invest in your future. Um, you have you know, this mentality that I know we're going to be around in, in, in a year or two to see the, the benefits of this thing that I'm going to invest time in. Um, you have uh, economies of scale where you can, you know, actually invest in building things without so much fear of someone coming and eating your lunch while you're, while you're busy trying to make things more reliable. Um, yeah, and uh, people are expensive. <laughs> so we try to scale you know, uh, we try not to scale our humans linearly with our uh, with, with our our loads, with our workloads. Uh, we try to deliver more with fewer people, um, and that's where platforms, you know, really really come in. Um, start building things that are going to you're going to be able to build on top of more products. Wonderful, and I I, I agree with all of that. Having gone through the uh, you know from Series A to, to IPO at places, the the goals shift rapidly. Uh, that things exactly. change a lot, um, and I I do think you you said something to me in a previous conversation we had that that mm -hmm. stuck with me, which is that in some ways being able to operate effective SRE is a function of company success, and I think yeah. this ties into that. Right, you can't invest upfront. Yeah. You're worried about how much runway you have, but um, I want to I want to keep us moving along and discuss uh, sort of how we got to where we are at Datadog. Uh, so, as I mentioned, Datadog was founded in 2010, and we're not going to go through every point here on this, but I think you can, if if you take anything away from this, I want you to take away the fact that changes frequently, the structure shifts, the way we think about things, the priorities of the SRE team change, they're reactive, they depend on the stage we are as a business, and what the immediately immediate challenges facing us as, a, as an engineering and SRE org are. Um, 
Laura, is there any any specific uh, points from this timeline that you want to call out? I think I think the other thing that I that I think is really interesting about this timeline, besides sort of the the converging and expanding and the changing org structures, as you know, as the company changes and we try to figure out what the role of SR in the, is in the company and and that role changes. Sort of in addition to that theme, I want to point out that now in 2023, we're finally turning down. We swear we're, we're killing the last of it. Some of those productivity tools from 2015 and 2018 that our SRE teams wrote um, because they're no longer a reasonable way to operate the company, but there's no such no such thing more temporary, more permanent than a temporary solution in software, right? And and these weren't really written to be temporary solutions. They were written to be long-term solutions to problems, but as we've grown past them, they are hard to get rid of. And so I think that, you know, one of the things that it's useful to call out is that we spend a lot of time cleaning up after those past decisions, right? Tech debt is a never ending cycle and that doesn't mean it's bad, which I know you wanna talk about Brandon, but uh, <laughs> it, it is a thing that will be with us forever. Well, thank you, Laura, speaking, speaking of tech debt. Um, as we mentioned, this is something that is not not necessarily unique to Datadog. Every company deals with tech debt, but I want to take a moment to just quickly define tech debt because I think in many ways it's misunderstood, and some of the definitions out there um, are are a little bit wrong. So very quickly, uh, tech debt is a, a metaphor that was coined by Ward Cunningham. If that name sounds familiar, he was the creator of the Wiki concept and a key contributor to early object oriented design patterns. Um, but he conceived of this metaphor to convince his managers to take on debt. He thought that the ability to run experiments cheaply and try out code was a good thing. The way that I think of tech debt is that it represents the gap between our understanding of the systems and the problem space that those systems operate in and the level of understanding represented in our code. So sometimes you can ship code faster to learn things at understand more about the system, but you have to come back and, and pay down that debt eventually. So tech debt is not always a bad thing. In fact, you have to take on some tech debt, especially if you're a startup, if you want to su survive. But I, I do want to make an important distinction that tech debt is not the same as bad code or bad software. If you write bad code, you're going to make it hard for you to pay off your tech debt. So even if you are running experiments and mm -hmm. writing code that you think will be short lived, you have to write it in a way that it's easy to reason about that it's clean code that you're doing things idiomatically. So there's a difference between tech debt and bad code. So please keep those things in mind. Tech debt and bad code are different. And tech debt is not always a bad thing. And when it was invented, it was presented as a good thing. It's it's an investment, right? Like all debt is should be an investment that you're you're using to pay forward. I think the other the other thing that's missing is that tech debt can be that gap between the world as it was when you wrote this code and the world as it is now, right? If you've yeah. grown 10x or 100x, that's tech debt that your code doesn't handle that scale, and it won't. Yes, yeah, so that those those systems and those problem spaces continue to evolve, so you have to constantly be reevaluating your how you're positioned relative to, to those. Yeah. I, I think tech debt is also just a horribly branded concept, right? Because um, it, it it implies that what's great about what what differentiates software engineering from other kind of engineering is the fact that we can delete and rewrite with you know with little impact. So it implies that you know there's like debt has this bad connotation, but it, yeah, it's just decisions that were made before and are being reevaluated. You know. Um, yep. And um, one thing I also want to mention is that complexity by itself is not necessarily bad. It's just a an inherent part of a system that evolves over time and increases scale, right? So this yeah. is a, a slide that I stole from a talk that Rick gave before, but I really like it, uh, basically showing that you have to continue to refactor things over time to deal with increasing complexity if you want your systems to stay reliable. Um, if you have symptoms of tech debt, you, you can't do that refactoring. And, and Rick, I think you spoke about this, but um, some can you walk me through just a, a couple of those symptoms of tech debt, like knowledge silos, lack of abstractions, all of those things? Yeah, I mean, there's all sorts of ways that you can accumulate tech debt or things can be seen as tech debt. I think we had a conversation the other day, the three of us, we were talking about 
the difference between um, you know being able to make a change in code versus being able to actually deploy the change, right? Um, you know, sometimes something as simple as your CI CD system can become tech debt, right? If it worked fine when you had 10 engineers to deploy code on this on this system, and then as now you have 100 engineers and they're stepping on each other's toes, you're running out of runners on GitLab and things like, like that, that becomes tech debt. Um, you know, it was a perfectly fine solution when you started out, but now it's not. And then there's things that just change over, over the years, you know, something that was cutting edge and and reliable and 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 work for you 10 years ago might now i mean python 2 2 is the is the canonical example right like so much of the internet was built on python 2 and it and it lived right and no one would have said you know 15 years ago writing this thing in python 2 is adopting tech debt or taking on tech debt but all of a sudden it is yeah. um and it's the worst kind of tech debt because you know, it's causing security issues. <laughs> um, so sometimes these things just happen. Speaking of Python 2, I had to install Python 2 on my M1 Mac to generate these charts. Uh, but this is basically taking that complexity and making it real to Datadog. So this is uh, a chart showing the growth of the number of commits to one of our oldest repos, which is basically a bunch of Python services, mm -hmm. uh, the, the oldest repo at, at Datadog. So you can see, uh, the number of commits grows over time and that directly correlates with the growth of the co code base as well so lines of code are going up you can see there's some funky anomalies uh, i can only imagine the story of someone accidentally uh, squashing everything or doing a <laughs> git force or something that happened there in 2015 um, but then we also have this this chart of incidents over time mm -hmm. so you can see increased complexity leads to more incidents and that's not necessarily bad, more incidents doesn't mean things are worse off, right? It just means that you have more scale, more complexity, more products on your platform, whatever it might be. So um, so, so what you wanna see is your incidents per number of engineer or your incidents per dollar of revenue trend down, but incidents over time will trend up because your number of engineers and your dollars of revenues go up. Mm -hmm. So that's sort of uh, just to, to show that the tech debt that we're talking about, the complexity we're talking about, you, you can see it reflected directly in, in our code base as well. So how do you deal with some of that, that tech debt? Uh, well, as, as Rick mentioned in his introduction, he works on SRE stuff for one of our platform engineering teams. And that is definitely one way to approach tech debt. So uh, Rick, can you briefly tell us the story of uh, platform engineering and how you approach tech debt? Yeah, platform engineering is interesting. In with respect to SRE, because they've gotten clumped together um, over the last few years somehow. Uh, whereas platform engineering, you know, predates SRE by by decades. Um, it's not new to suggest that you know you build a platform upon which you build other things. Um, but when you think about SRE in terms of operating a service long term, which is the ultimate goal, operating something reliably long term. Um, coming up with platforms that encompass common problems uh, for all of your other products, right? Like if you think about something, a company like Datadog, which is similar to, to many SaaS companies, you, you have, you know, multiple product verticals that are, make up your, your whole product, right? Um, and each of those, we, each of those teams that build each of those product verticals is one of our customers. Um, so when I joined um, Datadog, it was as an SRE team to manage our uh, API monolith. Um, and we quickly realized that in order to break that apart and allow people to move quicker, we had to build something, a, a new platform um, for building API services that let us build you know, more kind of product vertical microservices. Um, but that wasn't because there was anything wrong, like anything bad about the original system it still today serves a, you know a, a, a lot of our traffic um and it was a very successful product so we had to pick out the things that were good about it and then make a platform that allowed our product teams to build much more quickly and much more reliably services that could be scaled that could scale independently um you know that could be monitored independently um that you know would hopefully live for a long, long, long time. Um, 
So we basically built a platform team out of an SRE group, right? The SRE group figured out what was good and bad and, and hard about APIs. And then we built a, a platform to actually serve that purpose. Um, and it's, you know, one of those projects that's taken a year to get to, it's now live, um, but it took a year to get to beta um, and we're migrating things over to it. Um, and the results are great so far. That, that's awesome. Those those are the types of things that as a developer, I love because you basically reduce the number of decisions that I have to make uh, by by orders of magnitude. You, you, with, the, with the platform, you've basically enabled me to focus on what I'm doing that is uh, special sauce for the business, stuff that is actually going to deliver value to our customers instead of design decisions that we've probably already made three or four times on, on other teams. So um, thank you for sharing. And again, that. speaking of that, that shift left of reliability, right? If you're developing mm -hmm. on the platform, you get a bunch of reliable choices for free. You don't have to think about adding them on later as an operational thing that you do. It's just designed yeah. right in the first place. And it's also addressing, you know, in a company at our size and um, it's common in a lot of big companies. Mm -hmm. The hard part about building an API, for example, is not, you know, writing the controller, right? That's that's not hard. Um, what's hard is deploying it at in in multiple data centers and multiple cloud providers, modern monitoring it correctly, um, you know, debugging it correctly, setting up traces and observability metrics. Um, you know, not all accidentally those, you know, building it so that it's got single tasks running as a single point of failure. Yeah, or e even building it, <laughs> you know, the CI, CD pipelines, you know, all of these low level features have teams that own, you know, that own the, that part of our, our stack. And it's the interfacing with those other teams that's hard. Um, and we see platforms as kind of sitting between the low level Datadog, you know, infrastructure teams and the 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 product developers up at top who have you know building front ends and 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 Python controllers or Go controllers. Yeah. I think we could have a a much longer conversation on. Platform. Yeah, let's keep moving. We're, Maybe we're, we can we're... do that in a future <laughs> episode. But uh, keep us rolling here. I'm going to make up some time on this next section. But there are, of course, multiple structures. Some of you are probably familiar with them. Um, we're not going to talk about all of them. Uh, there's the centralized model, which is basically like one SRE team that has everyone else as their customer. We don't use that one. To production. Yes, yeah. we don't. We don't use that model. Uh, so this is how we structure things at, at Datadog. We use the core SRE model and the embedded SRE model. Um, Rick works on a team that does more of the. Uh, well, I may be wrong on that. Actually, Rick's on a platform team. Sorry, uh, Rick is going to talk to us about the, the core model uh, and what that means. Laura is going to discuss the embedded SRE model, and then we're going to move into some best practices that we employ at Datadog. Okay, sure. So, um, the, the so we yeah we have both um, at Datadog. Um, the core SRE model is basically company wide, um, and they th that team focuses on continuous improvements um, at, on a company wide scale. So. Um, things like how do we safely deploy code across all of the data centers in a safe order? Like what's the, what are the, we have a set of rules for how long something has to sit in each availability zone before it's declared okay and moves on to the next one. How do we do Kubernetes admissions controllers? How do we do canaries and, and, and things like that? How do we do, uh, you know, we've built this thing called deploy trains that, let us deploy things safely across all of these uh, these data centers. Um, they also come up with, um, and I, 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 I think Laura is going to talk about the core incident commander. Um, we have a chaos engineering group, um, which works on the Kubernetes chaos controller, which is a really cool tool that we use for game days. Um, so they, uh, kind of, yeah, like this last point, they define the observability and SLO golden paths. Right. So they kind of set the the standard for like how are the product teams supposed to and just real quick, uh, SLL uh, SLO as a service level objective, if you're not familiar with that term, basically uh yeah. defining how reliable your systems need to be um contractually to for your customers. Right. right. Not necessarily contractually, but yeah. But making it a, That's making a well, no, state. an SL and yeah, an SLA is is contractual. An SLO is uh, advertised internally, generally, yeah. right? So, um, 
yeah, we have we have contractual agreements for our observability, uh, for our, our availability, and then each of our products um, has an internal SLO. So the, I think the interesting thing for people here is sort of how do you decide on these team structures? What are the what are the things to keep in mind? So I think uh, when I mentioned this before, Laura, your answer was, well, what what is the work that you're doing? Um, yeah, what, what do you want to accomplish? How broadly will it scale across your company? Who should you be accountable to as part of that, right? If you're if you're accountable to the product development team and, and to their management chain, then by extension, as an embedded SRE team, for example, at Datadog, who are accountable to those to those uh, those management groups, they wind up writing a lot of automation specific to those products, right, and specific to the needs of those products. Um, as a, a central SRE team, which is, for example, my team, we report more directly to an SRE lead. We are not in any particular product's engineering budget, and so we're not focused on one particular product, and we're also not accountable. Obviously, everybody at the company is accountable to whether we've got customers who are happy, um, but we're not directly accountable to, is this product getting shipped this month? Um, and so where where do those do those needs lie? And what what needs do you have as a company? What work are you trying to do? Right. That's that's a very management flavored question. Cool. Thank you. Uh just coming up on the last few minutes before we open into questions. So let's jump into these incident best practices. So when I joined Datadog, one of the things that I was impressed by uh, right away was the focus on incident management, incident response, um, how an incident is declared, defined. Um, it's very, very liberal in terms of declaring incidents at, at Datadog, uh, which I appreciate a lot. So we've developed a lot of best practices around how we handle incidents that I think uh, hopefully a lot of you watching will be able to find value in as well. So um, I'm going to turn it over to Laura to walk us through four of the different best best practices that we use uh, for incidents. Yes, yeah, so I mentioned in my intro that my team is the team primarily responsible for sort of establishing these incident best practices at Datadog and for making sure that they're shared across the company, that they're standardized and that they run really well. Um, so we do a few things. Um, so number one, we have a weekly review uh, it used to be a company-wide review of large-scale incidents, so our more severe customer-facing incidents. As the company has scaled, we now have so many engineers that we don't all have context on what each other are working on. So we're moving that to basically a team-based review or a part of the org-based review. So you work on this piece of the product, you have a review within your organization, and then you share a summary to the rest of the company. And we're using that as a place to blamelessly go through our postmortems and our follow-up tasks, in particular, to give engineers a forum to make each other better, right? If you've got, if you've had an incident and you want to present on it, and you know that other people in your org are going to ask you, well, why, why do you think it happened this way? Or what is your explanation for that? Then you take the time to dig in more, and that gives you a chance to fix things in a longer, in a longer term way. Um, so we raise our standards. Um, we use the Datadog Incident app, so incidents are tracked that way. Uh, that's how we go through um, and use uh, how, how we how we monitor how many incidents we're having, right? That's where that incidents over time comes from is that Datadog incident app. Um, I know that this is a quote from somewhere. I'm afraid I don't actually know the source. Um, I can tell you who I got it from, but that's not the original source. But an incident is an investment where you've already paid the majority of the cost up front involuntarily. And you can either choose to get that investment back or you can choose to throw it away. And if you don't do the analysis, you've chosen to throw it away. I love that. I have no idea where it came from though. <laughs> I also love that. I, I wish I had heard that before I took the production database down for the first time. <laughs> you know, you learn some great things from doing that, I bet. It's just experience. 100%. It's a very good experience, right? It's great. Uh, everyone should do it. <laughs> everyone should take down production at least once. Um, and we, we right. used to say, in fact, at Google, we used to say, you're not an SRE until you've, until you've taken down production at least once. So um, yeah, so, so sort of moving on, um, Rick briefly alluded to this, but one of the things that we do in order to support our many engineers on call at Datadog, so we, we do run in a largely you build it, you run it model at Datadog with some SRE support. One of the things that we do about that is we have a central role developed to help engineers with on-call response at large scale and customer communication. We call this our core incident commander role. It's actually a group of volunteers from across the organization, so it's not exclusively SREs. Um, 
And they're senior engineers and managers who have been at Datadog typically at least a year. They have broad knowledge of our systems and our organization, although they're not going to know everything in detail. What they're there to do is take charge of the incident response, right? To guide it to completion, to own it, to project manage the incident response and make sure that the right people are in the room, that they're prioritizing the customer mitigation and experience, that follow-up happens in appropriate ways, that people are, you know, generally speaking, unblocked and moving forward. Um, the main personality trait that we actually look for in these people is not, you know, you know technical things really well. We do look for technical judgment, but we largely treat seniority as a proxy for that. We assume you're senior because we trust your technical judgment. The main personality trait is you're not afraid to page people. You're not afraid to keep getting people in the room until you get answers. Um, one of the big things that we've been using this rotation for in the last year or so is to drive one of those cultural shifts that, that Rick was talking about earlier. So moving from people are free to people are expensive, your on-call rotations at a startup tend to be pretty toilsome. They tend to be loud. They tend to be painful. They tend to be um, very much interfering with your day-to-day -day life. Uh, We've been using the core IC rotation as a way to start to push. On-call doesn't have to be like that, right? It can be work with your life. It can be a reasonable amount of noise. It can be well-structured. It can be, um, you know, things, things that should be true that often aren't at a start because there's just not time to pay that down. But there are now, right? And using our core IC rotation and those volunteers, because we've got volunteers that can go back to their own teams and organizations to say, this can be better right? We're using it as a way to, to sort of teach that culture. Um, and then finally, we're also using it as a way to build tooling. Um, so building tools that make your life better is a really important feature of having a even a volunteer rotation, right? Mm -hmm. One of the things that's fun about this is that these are people who don't often get time to write code. And so telling them, yeah, if you spend a couple of hours hacking that together, it'll make everyone's life better. For some reason, they all seem pretty excited about doing that. Yes, yeah, simple things like, you know, little Slack apps and things that help tell you who to page, right? Yeah, and exactly. Are, yeah. Yeah, I, I incredibly love, simple things. I love things like this where we actively model the culture that we want to have as an organization. It's one of the things that I really like about data. Yeah, yeah, and I think important on, on that um, point is when this, when Core IC first started, you know, those managers, they were VPs, <clears throat> you know, they weren't just, you know, engineering managers, not just, but you know, and our CTO jumps into incidents, you know, if, if, if they're big enough. We, we spend, we spend more time kicking him out than, than letting true. him jump it's in true. these days, which I think is, you know, an important practice, right? It, he's got, he's got yeah. other things to do. Yeah. Um, and the incident handled. <laughs> let's talk about uh, game days. So what do we yeah, use? Game so, so game days are another incident practice that, you know, many companies like to do. Um, they're a really valuable way to test your failure scenarios. So when I say testing your failure scenarios, I mean, we've designed our system to be resilient against these specific things. We believe we can handle these problems. You should test that. It turns out that that will change out from under you if you're not regularly testing it, but you should be testing the things you think you can handle. There's no value to anyone of saying, we know that everything fails if this happens and then proving it. That's not useful. Um, so instead, how can you demonstrate, we think this works and we're right? That's what you should be thinking about for game days. You can also be thinking about how you practice your large scale incident response, right? Your run books and in general, your, your process of how you do your incident management. You pull in a core IC, they, they run things. We practice that in our large scale game days. Um, we use the chaos controller, which is open source uh, to test specific failures. So especially low level failures like network latency, um, you know, pod disruption, things along those lines. We use the chaos controller to help test those things. Largely team runs, teams run their own game days at that scale, but we do also run some larger scale game days for larger scale possible infrastructure failures. Mm -hmm. um, and then finally, especially speaking of running things at the team level, um, this is on the next slide, yeah. yeah. Uh, one thing that we encourage teams to do, and this is very specifically at a team level, is to run their own wheels of misfortune. So to practice their own incident response. Um, if you've never seen one of these, think of it as Dungeons and Dragons or other tab tabletop role-playing, but somehow even nerdier, because what you do is you role play <laughs> out as a tabletop role-playing style, uh, what happened in this incident? I always recommend to teams, so, so a lot of teams like to put these together when they first hear about these, they like to come up with incident scenarios that 
that could happen, we're sure they could happen. And let's let's instrument them and, and make them fail in, in our staging environment or whatever you have for pre-production. Um, and that's a lot of effort. And you also wind up sort of practicing something that doesn't really happen. So my recommendation is actually to practice last week's incident. Have whoever was on call last week and had an incident or had some particular page, have them run your will of misfortune and just go back in time in your observability data and show what happened. Because then what you're practicing is, first of all, stuff that actually breaks. It's essentially free to run, right? The preparation time is very minimal because you've already got all of your observability data. And where you don't have observability data, well, that was true to life. And finally, more people learn from doing it that way because then the person who was on call can see how other people on their team might have responded. And that can also be a valuable way of adding, um, adding learning. So there you go. Those are those are some basic incident practices. Obviously, SRE does things besides incidents, but one of the ways that we push SRE culture here at Datadog is by by expanding our incident practices. Yeah, and these are things that you know any size company can do, right? Absolutely. Um, which is what I think is really important about these slides, because um, people frequently say, "How do we start?" You know, incorporating SRE, and the first thing I say is, you know, have an incident response meeting, or an uh, an incident review meeting. You know, that's the number one thing. And you can be a 10 person company and do that. Yep. And and ask yourselves the question, can we can we automate this task away? Should a human have yes. been paid for this? Yes. How that do we make it point. not fail that way? That's the important question to be asking mm -hmm. at that meeting. Yeah. Great. Well, that brings us to the thank you slide. So we're through the prepared content. Rick, Laura, thank you very much for the great conversation. now we can take some q and a so the thing that i want to talk about first is how do you i i think we we sort of just talked about it a little bit with the incident response stuff but if you at are at a company where you're trying to get buy in for sre principles to create an org to have people worry about making the processes and systems better spending their time on this type of thing where where do you start how do you start getting buy-in for site reliability engineering? So my first question is actually, who do you need buy-in from? Do you need buy-in from management or do you need buy-in from on the ground engineers? So, because your strategies are different. Um, if what you need is buy-in from management, then what you what you wanna do is talk about sublinear growth, right? You know, as, as we grow in number of customers, what we want to do is see that the growth in number of incidents or you know number of dollars spent or engineering time spent on on operations or all of those things that that grows less than linearly with our number of customers right that's that's the management story um mm -hmm. and that's that's the selling point of SRV. it accomplishes that and you know that that looks like we treat our incidents as investments we design and build things in better ways we automate stuff um if what you need is buy-in with individual engineers, which can also be the way that you need to get buy-in, talk about quality of life, right? Talk about what I was just talking about with Core IC, right? On-call doesn't have to be like this and it shouldn't be like this. It should be a thing that is sustainable and you don't dread it. Um, and, and how do we get to there? Um, it should be a thing that is you know, a reasonable proportion of your life. Um, you know, I hate, loathe doing operational work. I always find it really funny to talk to people who who sort of encountered SREs um, at some organizations because they they expect that as an SRE that I, you know, love doing Linux admin things and, and I'm comfortable on the command line. And, and I'm just not like to be perfectly honest with you, I hate low level operational work and I am bad at it. And a lot of engineers do and are. And so one of the big selling points to engineers is we think you should have to do less of that. We think that that should be taken out of your hands and done automatically, but well for you. Um, you know, we we don't think that you should have to be an expert on all of these things. That's that's a lot of the selling point to engineers in terms of SREs around quality of life and not doing the things that you dislike. Yeah, I think it's it's also interesting that. Um... I mean, it obviously depends what size company you are when asking this question and what your problem you're really trying to solve. Like, where is your pain? Is the pain that you're getting paid a lot or is the pain that, you know, the the business is 
not providing a reliable service to their customers or you're not finding the time to address tech debt. Like what is the problem, right? I've been at a company where the problem was that we were getting paged too much and we couldn't get the, you know, the, the product uh, engineering asks to slow down so we could catch up the tech debt. And our CEO carried the pager around for a week and that's all it took. You know, before you know, he was getting paid in the middle of the night, and he said, "Okay, we'll 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 pause new development while you guys catch up, right?" Um, but there's also the and we didn't talk a lot about SLOs, SLAs, SLIs, right? Which are kind of the the core way we think about observability in in SRE. Those map really well to OKRs. So for bigger companies that use OKRs for tracking, it's 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 a nice way to say, "Okay, you guys like having measurable." you know, things that we're improving, well, look, here we have these observability metrics that we track really closely or we want to track really closely. And what if our OKR is to bring this not this error rate down by 10%, right? Or bring this 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 latency down or the time it takes us to bring up a new service, let's make that faster. Um, so those are really good strategies for just kind of- uh, Or for that uh, matter, you know, we want to do cost savings and we've got SLIs too. and SLOs to tell us whether we've- mm -hmm done that at an unacceptable cost to customers. Yeah, a lot of SRE um, from the software engineering side is making sure that all of those things that you can measure are measurable, right? So that you can report on very small and they fluctuations. And trade-offs explicitly, right? Yeah. That you don't just assume, right? Well, again, one of the reasons that people get paged too much is because they're getting paged on levels of customer errors that customers actually find acceptable. And you, Laura, I think are the one who loves to say most uh, incidents are self-harm or self-cause. Oh, I don't self usually <laughs> say that. I mean, it's true, right? If if, a, if your system is stable until you do something to it, and then you do something to it, well, yeah. then it's going to go unstable. Like, right. that's just yeah. going to be so true. Self-inflicted incidents are an incredible source of toil. And um, uh, No, my favorite, my favorite statistic is that 80% of incidents are caused by software. <laughs> And the other 20% of software we haven't written yet, right? Uh, no, the other 20% <laughs> is hardware usually. Yeah. Oh, I was going to say DNS. Dang. I thought you were saying humans. <laughs> yeah. uh, okay, great. Well, we, we did get one more question, um, right. which is th thankfully a, a question about Datadog. I, I don't want to get too into features or pitchiness here, but the uh, they asked what we think about SRE, SRE using the incident feature within Datadog to track things. And we we do, right? We, we dog food. Yeah. We absolutely do. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, and, and um, my team's actually worked quite a bit with the team that works on the incident app uh, over the last year, working to get that to be uh, a feature, uh, an app, a feature within Datadog that um, that really meets the needs mm -hmm. of incident response. So I think it's great. Um, I love to use it for all sorts of things. We do use it to track notes and roles and timelines um, ourselves. Mm -hmm. um, I always want to caution people about tra uh, about tracking timelines. There's things in timelines that are really valuable to track and things that aren't necessarily. Um, folks always like to try to measure MTTR as kind of the first thing that they um, that they approach when they start to measure their incidents. And if your MTTR goes down, that's not necessarily a good sign because it could mean that you're having the same incident over and over again. Um, so mm -hmm. don't necessarily just measure MTTR. Sometimes don't measure it at all. Think instead about things like how long does it take us to get to our first hypothesis for an incident? How long does it take to validate our hypotheses? Are we seeing new and different incidents? Those things are more useful to measure than your MTTR directly within your timeline. Um, in terms of actual features, uh, there's not a way to automatically declare an incident. Uh, and the reason for that is because it's an incident when there's verified customer impact and we do dep depend in general on humans to do that. Um, certainly feel free to request that as a feature. Uh, but once you declare an incident, it will post automatically. Yeah, yeah it's it's great. I think it, similar to any other tool like that, um, it's best when always used, right? So, um, you know, we spent some time picking out uh, tags and stuff like that. And it's really useful now to be able to go and say, how many incidents over the past year were caused by Postgres in data center foo? right and actually get a result and be able to go through them all and see what happened and how bad it was um, worked hard on that glad you like it <laughs> thank you loved it <laughs> um 
yeah and and the integration with with uh with slack is great because as people are posting things and links to datadog uh you know links to graphs and stuff like that you can just say you know record it record it record it and then it just shows up in the incident app and um we uh even use uh for instant reviews a lot of folks use the incident app or a notebook for present they pop in presentation yes, we, we use the notebook postmortems and the, yeah. the notebook postmortems have a presentation mode and that's how we mostly have cool. people do their their incident reviews we we work really hard to make it as low um low effort as possible because my our, our general experience is that it turns out that engineers will not do a lot of paperwork uh hmm. they have any way to avoid it yeah. yes yeah. well we have come to the end of our hour. Uh, I've had a lot of fun. Thank you very much to everyone out there on the internet, friends of Datadog. Thank you, Laura. Thank you, Rick. Thank you, everyone that asked a question. Uh, this will be available on YouTube and on the website uh, shortly if you want to review it or share it with anyone. And make sure you tune in for Datadog on uh, Data Pipelines with Apache Spark on March 23rd. We'll see you next time. Thanks. Thanks, everybody. It was great. Thank you very much.